No, no, no. We wait for the 20 seconds to go. <laughs> so. so welcome. So we are very happy that you made it, uh, even if it's uh, even if the sun is outside. But uh, maybe we can actually bring some some light uh, as well in this room. Um, so. Thank you for coming. Um, we will talk about, uh, or the official title of this session is Tracking Sanctions. So we want to discuss a topic that was um, all over the place in the beginning of last year, but it was also um, always a little bit under the radar in terms of um, investigating or f uh, working in a journalistic way. Um, so um, before, I would say February 22, 2022, sanctions were, was a topic for specialists, was a kind of an obscure thing. Uh, not many people, not even not governments, were really interested in it. But with the Russian war against the Ukraine, it became a prominent political tool. And um, it's very nice that, uh, that I have uh, two wonderful colleagues who sit here at this table today, because all three of us had encounter encounter with this topic in really very different ways, I would say. Um, so the idea is to talk um, about the approaches uh, to work about sanctions and some findings that led to conclusions um, also about the effectiveness of uh, this tool that many governments call an economic weapon that the West used as a kind of a stop sign against the Russian war. Um, so before we start and uh, go right into it, I would... Uh, like to do a small introduction round. Um, we don't have a moderation, so we're kind of moderating ourselves a little bit. Um, but uh, I'm trying to guide through the next 50 minutes. So I would um, suggest that we all uh, kind of introduce ourselves. And then, uh, please, Juliet, uh, go ahead. Uh, so I'm Juliet Alsight. Oh, I'm deputy um, business editor at The Guardian in London. Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, I'm deputy uh, business editor at The Guardian in London. Um, and uh, at The Guardian, we have, um, within our business team, led a lot of the papers reporting around sanctions um, and commissioned a number of investigations um, starting in February of last year. And um, in particular, uh, the Russian asset tracker, which I'll be presenting to you uh, uh, later on in the speech. Uh, wonderful. My name is Friedrich Linnenberg. Um, I am sort of a technologist building um, tools for investigative reporters, and I'm running opensanctions.org, which, as the name indicates, is relevant to today's session. Yeah, and my name is uh, Justus von Daniels. I'm uh, the editor in chief of the German nonprofit newsroom Korrektiv. So we do a lot of investigative stuff, um, community building, media education. Uh, kind of a store of something now, uh, but um, I'm the one who's leading the investigating, investigative um, team. Yeah, so we want to talk about uh, more or less uh, two um, uh, different products, actually, which came out last year. One is called the Sanctions Tracker, and the other is called the uh, Russian Asset Tracker. It's a nice uh, way of introducing a term into journalism that, that is not so often used um, so far. And I would like to start with um, the approach um, we took at uh, Corrective. So at uh, February 22, 2022, um, you can also like do the other slide as well um, before, yeah, exactly. So that was the initial initiative um, that many uh, governments uh, thought what to do about the war, uh, not to be a party of the war. Um, so the sanctions became a viable political tool very quickly. And the first sanctions were introduced right in the beginning of these uh, days when the, when the Russians started their aggressive, uh, the, the, the aggression. Um, so for us as journalists, uh, sitting in Berlin, sitting in Germany, it was really hard not to jump right into this topic. We didn't really have um, access to Russia. We didn't really have access to Ukraine. But we thought we should do, we have to do something. And uh, let's look at what the West is doing and how they are doing it. Um, if they implement sanctions, what does it mean? 
And our, um, or what journalists normally do is just they, they, they go on the internet and look uh, something up. So does it already exist? Something kind of an overview of sanctions, uh, who's imposing what sanctions against whom? And uh, to my surprise, it was really, uh, yeah, it was really hard to find any viable information about it uh, because the uh, governments um, published their sanctions in a very obscure way exactly because there was no interest before in sanctions. So that's why it was kind of, uh, it was always on the press release, but beside press release, there was no information about it. And I th we thought in terms of transparency, um, it is very dangerous not to track actually who's actually imposing uh, sanctions against whom. So that's why you can um, go to the next one. Uh, that's why we had a kind of an idea, which was a kind of an ideal idea. So if we could imagine something, which is called a tracker, um, where we have a tool which collects all relevant sanctions by all relevant um, organizations or countries worldwide, a tool which is kind of tracking the sanctions which are imposed live, because that was another observation we had. In the first days, um, they imposed hundreds, or there were hundreds of sanctions imposed every day um, by, by many countries, um, but you couldn't really uh, see, um, yeah, you couldn't really, you couldn't really see, you know, um, did a sanction, for example, that the US imposed on a person was also imposed uh, by the European Union. It was really hard to, to track that. Um, so what if we had this kind of tracker, not only for our own use, for our own investigative um, uh, work, but also to make this whole thing more transparent so that other people, other journalists, other experts, experts can also like um, access uh, the information. Um, so um, that's why we thought, you know, a dream would be to have a sanctions tracker. And uh, a dream would also be, it was like February 22, uh, to put it up as soon as possible because that was exactly the time when all these debates started and we thought we cannot wait, wait, we should do something. Um, so what to do about it? We didn't have the resources, we didn't know how to find sanctions uh, in a structured way, we didn't know how to display them in a structured way, um, but as, uh, as uh, it's already written there, uh, there was a shortcut and for this shortcut I would hand over to my colleague Friedrich. Wonderful. Um, oh yeah, uh, I want to um, yeah take you on a on a slight detour from talking about the escalation of the um, Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022. Um, I think Open Sanctions is a project that was actually started in the regional train um, from Perugia to um, Florence in 2016, and the idea was okay, let's try and um, build a sanctions-related data project for investigative journalists, and. Um, this is not about the policy so much, it's about using sanctions as an investigative tool. What I might mean by that is imagine you have a leaked data set, right? Whether it's like the, the next Panama Papers or whether it's a, um, a, the internal emails of an of a, of a international law firm, um, you have to start investigating somewhere, right? You have to start looking somewhere. So what do you do? You start searching for things, right? And so what do you start searching for? Well, I might start searching for Olaf Scholz, the prime minister of my country. Then I go to the finance minister because next in line, right? Um, but that's not very systematic, right? So the question is like, if I had to search for every leak that comes out, a million names, what would be that million names that, would, that I would put in first as a search term? And then to know these are people who have interesting international dealings, who are involved in whether it is crime, whether it is kleptocracy, whether it is um, central political uh, functions. And so that's the idea of open sanctions, is to say, let's have a standard set of, <clears throat> of investigative queries that we can use. Like doctors use contrast dye. Maybe some of you know this procedure when you're, um, when you're going um, to an MRI, right? And they inject you with contrast dye, which then makes visible what's actually going on in your body. And in that sense, I think kind of, um, having information on like who are the people that are usually involved in crime is quite a useful way of then starting to kind of d dive into an investigation, right? And sanctions data just happens to be one of those places because obviously governments are taking the time to write up a list of all the people they don't like, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize in this point that this is utterly, 
utterly political, right? There's no courts that decide who gets sanctioned. This is a government-made list, right? Um, these are political shit lists, right? So you have um, the, uh, America making one about the rest of the world. You have Russia making one about the rest of the world. China hasn't quite gotten there yet. They just do the press releases, really. They don't make a list. But like, you have like, basically frozen geopolitics, if you will. And so that's what I find interesting about sanctions. And so Open Sanctions is a project that collects, at the moment, I think 37, sorry, international sanctions lists from different, different places, anywhere from um, the US, Switzerland, Europe, uh, to Malaysia and Dubai. Um, what you have to understand for that is that until the, um, the escalation of the conflict um, in, uh, well, in Ukraine from Russia, um, it, most sanctions lists were mostly based on the UN list. Um, so the UN Security Council releases a list. Obviously, that's entirely lost its significance now, given that the Security Council is basically um, become become a sort of sort of joke in trying to enforce international rules-based order. Um, there's more than um, than sanctions in uh, in open sanctions. There's also what, what's called politically exposed people, people who are politicians who've held office in in the recent past, or even in some cases people who are relatives to politicians. Um, and we're also pulling in some crime data, right? So that is, for example, companies that have um, defrauded in, in, in government procurement processes, and it's other uh, lists like Interpol that kind of have a public wanted list. Um, and then what we're doing that I want to kind of explain in the next slide is pull in contextual data from different public sources as well. And the idea is basically to produce high quality data as an investigative tool. Um, Weirdly enough, it turns out that if you collect a list of everyone who's sanctioned, it turns out not just to be interesting for um, a very broke investigative journalist, um, but it's also uh, really interesting to f fintech and regulatory technology companies. So Open Sanctions is now also working as a business. Um, what it does basically is um, that it collects information from these, these sources, right? And um, the idea there is to have like both formal sources and informal sources. You can see maybe at the bottom there, there's Navalny, which is sort of the anti-corruption foundation list of, 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 of Russian actors that they think uh, should be targeted international sanctions. All of that gets turned into a common data format. And I, I apologize for throwing up a complex technical diagram at 2.12 in the afternoon. This is, this is obviously violence, but it had to be done. Um, but yeah, so, so this gets converted to like a standard data format that's called Follow the Money, um, which basically stores all this information about who's on the sanctions list. Um, and then what we do is we deduplicate them, right? Because if you think about it, right, for some reason Saddam Hussein is still on the UN sanctions list, right? I, I assume this is related to like uh, asset recovery court cases. Um, but so you have, uh, if you put in 37 uh, sanctions lists, you have 37 copies of Saddam Hussein. And like a lot of the work that we do is to kind of try and make one Saddam Hussein that says, I am very much not liked by these 37 countries. Um, what's really interesting is kind of this process that we call enrichment and that we also kind of, just for those of you who are data journalists, that's also like an open source tool that you can reuse. Um, and the idea there is to then go and say, okay, each of these people that come from one of those lists, we turn them into a search query against all the other databases that we can think of. For example, Wikidata, where we get really detailed um, information about individuals, open corporates and open ownership, where we get information on company ownership um, or um, other kind of investigative tools where we can kind of pull in not just kind of this, this entity that's targeted sanctions right now, but like what are the, the people and companies that are linked to them and then kind of do that over and over and over again. And this way we build a data set that contains not only kind of companies and people that are directly sanctioned, but also those related to them. Um, and then that basically gets turned into a website that you can go to at opensanctions.org and just search um, a kind of fairly vast corpus of, 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 of people of interest. And we make obviously the data available as downloads so you can use it in your own analysis in, on, your, on your own laptop. And, and we also use it in a project called Open Screening that I want to talk about in a second. Um, so Open Screening basically is an attempt to then um, load this tool, uh, load all this data together with company ownership information from I think at the moment 14, 15 countries into sort of a tool called Linkurious where you can explore it as a network diagram and sort of put in your searches and really visually kind of explore this data together with company information and um, the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, etc. So um, you can go to that link down there um, and, um, and sign up and get a free account and use that also for your investigations. Um, 
Finally, I, wanna, I wanted to kind of show, yeah, the, the kind of idea then is that with the war, obviously the question became less like, okay, is, is this individual, what do we know about this individual? But it, it also became like this, this bigger analysis of like what countries are being really progressive in, in sanctioning um, uh, instruments of the Russian kleptocracy and, uh, and what countries are holding back because they're too invested into the game, right? Um, speaking about the UK and Switzerland here, if that makes any sense. Um, so um, yeah, that's kind of then taking it to kind of a policy analysis or like an analysis of almost the horse race of, of, of sanctions enforcement. And I think that's where I want to hand it back to, uh, to Justus. mentioned um, is something I just call magic, sorry to say, <laughs> but I don't try to understand it. Um, but it's, it's wonderful, you know, that it, it, is, it is possible. And that was exactly our initial idea when I talked to our developer, or we worked together with the developer, when I said, you know, I would like to have, or it, it would be wonderful to have a sanctions tracker. He said, yeah, uh, go to Friedrich, he has all the data um, somewhere dumped in, a very, in, in various ways. And, um, and, and this actually was something which I call uh, um, a journalistic miracle, that we were able to uh, work together like uh, in a wonderful way to, with, a, with um, a designer, with develop, two developers, and also from the journalistic perspective, to create something that actually um, brings all your work into a life to consume this in an in a, in a easy way. I, I think that was the main the main thing. And, and from the journalistic perspective, we had the difficulty to say there's so many data, um, how to work with it? Um, should we actually digest them in a way qualitatively, sort of work with these data? Or should we make them available as easy, accessible as possible? So that's why we just uh, set up an own web page uh, where we kind of displayed only the sanctions, you know, the total number of the sanctions against Russia um, uh, on a daily basis, so it's, a automatic, it's, it's an automatic tracker. Um, it's a feature that, that pulls all the data you are collecting automatically to our site. So it is uh, updated um, yeah, more or less every day. You see you now it's, uh, the, up the update doesn't work for the last week. Um, I'm sorry to say that, but that's also true. So there's also some, some, some things to repair all the time. Um, but... Um, yeah, so we, so, so we started, so we, so we found some ways, or we thought uh, what might be interesting to people um, to work with them or to, or to work with this, with this topic. Uh, one is a timeline. Uh, it's just a very interesting thing. You see you know, how the sanctioning system developed over time and what happened, especially in the last year. But also um, in, the, in the months, and uh, you can see you know, they're kind of more active, more inactive uh, months. Um, another an, another uh, way to visualize all these data um, were, were these two ways, which uh, I think is are very useful. Um, one is to uh, the, the the one on the left you see is um, something where we kind of differentiate in a very general way between sanctions against persons and sanctions against companies and other sanctions. And the right one is also very interesting because if you sc um, you cannot scroll it down huh? uh, mm -hmm. because no. Um, it's, it's, um, it gives you an idea um, of the most important countries imposing sanctions. I think the UN is still there, but it doesn't matter. But it's the US, um, uh, it's uh, Europe, Great Britain, Switzerland. Um, and you can see uh, which countries impose how many sanctions on which day. Yeah, so this, is, can, this shows also like some activity. And this is especially important if you are researching this uh, topic. And you remember that, for example, the European Union has these uh, sanction um, periods, you know, when they have these sanction packages, or somehow they call it, uh, 1 to 10 or 1 to 7, I think, uh, up to now. So these are all information to work with. So, this is, uh, so that, was, that was the idea of a journalistic project that we actually create some transparency. Um, and here you can see, if you want to dive a little bit into the whole system and into Friedrich's, uh, Friedrich's system, 
you can use actually this list. So it's a, it's a searchable database and you can search for any person or any company which has been sanctioned. Um, and you get some results. And what you get here is also kind of, an, kind of a good overview, I think, because you know, so you get information about when this person was sanctioned, from by whom. So, um, so in this case, you see Ukraine, Great Britain, US. This guy is a German uh, citizen, and it's very interesting that he's not sanctioned by uh, the European Union. And he's one of the closest friends of Vladimir Putin. He's the one actually who brought all this gas dependency to Germany. He's a really bad guy. Um, and the US were the only one who sanctioned them last year. And only afterwards, Great Britain came and Ukraine came and U the European Union is still not there. So you can- Excuse me, he's a trusted business partner of the German government. What Sorry. do you want from yeah. him? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe you know more. And you get also like a, uh, the source. So this URL leads you to the, uh, in most cases, ideally to the original source. So for example, to uh, the original database by the US Treasury Department, which actually publishes uh, the lists um, uh, on a regular basis. Um, yeah, we got some, we got some immediate reactions. Um, um, one was very uh, interesting for us as journalists. We got a lot of calls from professional experts so from companies like uh, Boston Consulting, from uh, state departments uh, from various countries, because they called us or wrote us emails saying, your, uh, your sanctions tracker is down today. What's wrong? Wow. Um, so that was really interesting that these people actually dependent, uh, depended in a way on the information we had because we were the only one at that time, as, uh, at least, that had this daily base update. So it was not only a use for some journalists who did some stories about it, uh, but also like for the, for the professional experts, which, uh, yeah, for us, it was just um, interesting to see, let's say. Um, but we took it a, one step further. Um, so once we um, had put up uh, this whole web page, uh, we got contact to Lighthouse uh, reports. I guess many of you know uh, the organization is also like a nonprofit organization, uh, very present here at, at Perugia as well. Lighthouse reports from the Netherlands. And they called us up and they said, you know, we're doing something about oligarchs. And maybe we can, should team up to do some more qualitative project which we can present um, also on your webpage in a way. Their interest was, was the idea was to use the list and to make a qualitative research in which, I mean, what kind of persons are the persons who are sanctioned. So try to categorize these persons, which is not easy, not always easy. So sometimes there's an official title or also like an official reason why this person is sanctioned. But for many, um, for many journalists, um, and this is where Juliet comes into uh, place right now, uh, for many journalists, the oligarchs were, um, were a main, uh, of course, a main uh, interest also um, uh, to, to research in you know, which assets they have, um, how they are sanctioned and whatever. So we tried, we tried to do um, a qualitative project and uh, which um, was then uh, displayed in this way. So we also make a, a searchable database um, that you can see what kind of categorization for uh, this uh, a person falls into. And for the category, we had like military and media and politician, that's quite easy. The category oligarch is not an official category, of course, but so we used or kind of put together different definitions um, for oligarchs. And in the US, as many of you know, they have a kind of unofficial um, definition, which is not too bad. Um, and then there are um, also like reports you read or it's kind of some, also like some media reports where you can see, okay, is this a person who um, uh, has a certain asset value, who um, was part of privatization of certain Russian uh, companies, state companies, and or, and or is, has an, uh, had or has a kind of political influence into the Russian system. So it's kind of a, a little bit blurry and we can also like discuss, you know, where you draw, where you draw the line. We were kind of conservative and so um, we kind of, oh no, was it me? Apparently it works. Okay. <laughs> um, so in the end, so yeah, I didn't include it. In the end, we also have a, have a graphic on our webpage, uh, which where you can actually see on a chart um, how many people are sanctioned and in which category they fall. So that was actually the kind of the one qualitative 
investigation we did. We did some other qualitative smaller things with, uh, with sanctions in Germany. But um, I think the much more valuable work was uh, done by the Russian Asset Tracker, which has no connection to what we did, uh, but which appeared, I think, just a week before or yeah. after we actually published. So that's why Juliet, yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Thank you, Eustace. Um, uh, we were grappling with the same things at the same time, and I'm sure we weren't alone. Um, and you're, you have produced kind of magic. Um, I had someone manually inputting the updates uh, to the sanctions list in the UK um, for the first few weeks, and uh, uh, definitely wish I'd known about your guys' project at that point. It would have saved us a lot of time. Um, but I'm going to talk about two things um, today. So one is the Russian Asset Tracker, which we put together, which was more really, for us, a piece of content, but it was jointly with the OCCRP, who did something, who did a really a visual interactive database with it. Um, and then uh, second part, I'm going to talk about the difficulties in imposing sanctions and the work that journalism can do around that. Um, really what sanctions are for. Um, that is quite a big debate, um, as Fred alluded to earlier. So, how did it begin? Well, it was January um, 22, and the Russian army was massing on the borders of Ukraine, and it was clear that there was going to be some kind of invasion, some kind of attack on Ukraine. Um, and so what we wanted to do was build up a list of uh, businessmen, oligarchs, if you like, um, who'd benefited from the Putin regime, and uh, tell everyone what they owned, track down, you know, I've worked... Um, since the Panama Papers on a series of offshore leaks. We had a lot of the information um, uh, there in the leaks, and we could combine that with up-to-date registries from land registries to corporate registries and that sort of thing. So we thought we could, we could compile a database, but, uh, and, and we did. And uh, we, so, so in, a, in, in um, overview, we ended up with 35 Putin regime insiders um, there, we found over $20 billion of assets, and of course that included the jets, the yachts, the mansions, the cars, the bank accounts, and 30 uh, prize-winning horses belonging to the Abramoviches, um, uh, which are all listed in detail on the OCCRPs, and by name on the OCCRPs website, if you care to have a look. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, so, but we faced a challenge, and that was, you know, we're in the UK, um, uh, the British courts are stacked against journalists in favour of those with the money to pursue defamation cases, and for years oligarchs had been um, at silencing British journalists, stopping them calling them all oligarchs, stop, because that's, uh, stopping them saying that they were benefiting from the Putin regime. Um, so we needed, and, and also there's a lot of people you could choose to put on that list. Um, so we needed a list, and we needed a list we could defend. Uh, and that's when um, I um, thought about using this list we call the Navalny 35. So um, it was a list of um, a regime insiders drawn up by the um, Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, who's currently in prison in Russia and very unwell. Um, and his organization had been putting forward these names to the US government, uh, the EU, and the UK government to try, uh, back in 21 to try and get them added to sanctions lists back then. Um, and helpfully, um, uh, a representative called Tom Malinowski, who's a great anti-corruption um, uh, campaigner in the US House, Houses of Congress, um, had read the names of all 35 onto the congressional record. Um, and you can find it there. Um, in the, in, the, um, in the Congressional Record Gazette. And if you look um, over on the right-hand side, I've highlighted in blue, that's Igor Shuvalov, um, who's uh, chairman of um, uh, the State Development Corporation um, in Russia, um, and also happens to have a lot of personal wealth. So on this list were, um, and, and the reason this is a protection for journalists is because uh, we are allowed to report the proceedings of a parliament, of, of an elected assembly, without being sued for defamation. So things can be said uh, in, in parliament, in the Congress, uh, and, and the politicians can't be sued, and the press can't be sued for reporting it. So we had our safe list. Um, and it was, it was a, a manageable number. We wanted to get the project out quickly. Um, and uh, so you know, as we were working, Russia invaded. Um, as we were working, the sanctions uh, began to uh, happen and be imposed. Um, and it turned out to be, I think, probably the most comprehensive 
uh, package of sanctions by Western governments against any other state in history, I think, probably. I mean, I, I don't think we've seen anything on this scale, perhaps even in Iran, just in, in terms of the amount of wealth and assets um, and the number of countries taking part. It goes well beyond anything the UN has ever done. Um, and so we published on 21st of March, and that was just one month after the invasion. Um, and uh, we found, um, as I said, land, mansions, etc. We focused mainly on four oligarchs, Roman Abramovich, Alisha Usmanov, Oleg Deripaska, and Gennady Timchenko. Those were the two, the four really wealthy business people in the list. Others were wealthy. Um, so people like uh, the former deputy prime minister, um, of Russia, um, that Shuvalov guy, uh, Igor Sechin, uh, who, oh, Shuvalov has a, um, a, a multi-million duplex apartment around the corner of the Houses of Parliament in, in London, has had since the privatization era. Uh, uh, so he must have made some money during that period. Um, and Igor Sechin, uh, head, head of the um, state-owned uh, oil and gas company Rosneft, who's got a yacht named after his mistress. Um, uh, so they, so it was not just, you know, it's, it's state officials, uh, media people, quite a few people had interesting assets. Um, we did the classic thing, we did the stories. So for Ismanov, who owned, uh, at one point, owned um, Arsenal Football Club in the UK and several really huge mansions, one of which belonged to a Getty, I think, at one point, um, he actually told us they didn't belong to him. He'd given them away to his family through irrevocable trusts. Uh, years ago, and we think he did it just after the annexation of Crimea, when Western governments were considering sanctioning him. They didn't in the end uh, until until last year, but he stashed the assets away safely with family members. He transferred them to family members. So that was one story, and then we did things on his links to the owner of Everton Football Club, which we think he is the pot potentially a shadow financier behind. Um, and then uh, the OCCRP, um, created this searchable database. So what they did was, um, uh, and, and we pulled together a big coalition. So we had 24 reporting partners all around Europe, uh, each looking through their own national registries, trying to find assets, confirm the ownership of assets. We set a quite high bar. We need documentary evidence uh, of links, very strong links between an asset and the owner. Um, the information was fed into uh, a form uh, on the OCCRP website with documents uploaded. That was fed into a spreadsheet, and then that went into an interactive database. Um, and it, it had some impact when we launched. I think we were one of the first big reporting projects on the subject at the time. Uh, and the European Commission invited the team to present its findings um, to its Freeze and Seize Task Force, which includes judges and prosecutors from all the EU countries. And there was some new legislation quite soon afterwards uh, to make the confiscation of assets easier. Um, so, so we were able to do that. Um, but as we as the year has gone on, um, as the last 12 months has, months have rolled by, we've seen through a lot of our reporting and inquiries that sanctions are really difficult to enforce. There's the question about what they're for. You know, at the moment, most most of these assets are frozen. Their ownership is paused. They haven't been confiscated. They haven't, they're not available to the exchequers of the countries where they are to sell and raise money, perhaps for reparations of Ukraine. I think uh, there's quite a lot of action around making that happen. There's probably quite a lot of lobbying to stop it. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and very difficult to find a buyer um, for a yacht that costs 10, 20 million a year to run unless you're selling it to an oligarch, which you know you can't do uh, right now. Um, so, um, so what are the difficulties for, for, for enforcing, for, for not us, but for, for governments to enforce sanctions? Um, well, first of all, the assets are hard to find, and it's hard to pin down ownership. Um, for example, Roman Abramovich's probably most expensive home is a 150 million pound mansion around the back of a royal palace in Kensington in London. <coughs> Um, and at the moment, it's, uh, it's not frozen, which means it's not blocked, which means it could be sold. And the reason for that is it's owned by, um, ultimately, by a trust. Um, and what our reporting uncovered um, just at Christmas, actually, just early in January, was that via a Cyprus offshore services firm, Roman Abramovich quickly, in the few weeks before he was sanctioned, managed to reshuffle his trusts and make his family majority beneficiaries and there's this rather crude uh, and this is another problem with sanctions there's this rather crude rule of thumb it seems with sanctions that 
if the asset is minority owned by the person who really paid for it. Um, uh, so if they own less than 50%, it, the, the asset can't be blocked because there are other owners. Uh, and it's, it is the 50% rule that Abramovich appears to have used when reshuffling his trust. So that property, we think, belongs to family members in the majority now. So it could, in theory, be sold without him, have, you know, them having to apply for a license um, from the UK Sanctions Office. Um, and that brings me to the other problem with sanctions. It's families. You know, you'll see a lot of men on these lists, but these men have wives and ex-wives and children and mistresses. Um, and they're often, and associates, and they're often used, all of these are often used to um, transfer assets to in a hurry. So, for example, um, we reported on the Gutseria family, the father made the money, uh, Russian, but his contacts are in Belarus, and he was sanctioned as part of the Belarusian <coughs> sanctions over the, the violent repression of the political rebellion there a couple of years ago. Um, but the son was not, and we found he had a massive property portfolio in London. Um, luckily, when we and he was able to, you know, buy and sell and move around. But luckily, when we reported it, the government of the UK is, you know, as, as Fred says, um, seeing this as a political tool at the moment, and was very quick to sanction the Sun too. So in that case, it worked. They've also sanctioned, I think, Lavrov, um, the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov's mistress's daughter, who had some very valuable property in London. Um, and the other. The other kind of major issue is um, loopholes. Those could be jurisdictions which are quite friendly to this money. Um, so we've seen, you know, Cyprus facing both ways a little bit. You know, helping Abramovich via one of its enablers um, uh, and um, resisting to a certain extent in previous years anyway sanctions against Russian individuals because they say, well, you can sanction us, but you know, Turkey's not a member of the EU and. If uh, Turkey will take their money if, if, if we don't. Um, and they're right, actually. Turkey um, is, is, certainly for yachts, um, uh, its harbors have been open to Russian ships and pleasure craft. Uh, you know, they all fled there from wherever they were, overwintering in St. Bart's, in Monaco, in Antibes. Um, a lot of yachts ended up in Turkish luxury ma marinas. And then there's obviously there's the UAE, Dubai in particular. Um, and a lot of enablers are moving their operations over there, opening up offices um, to help bring that money in. And they have closed registries in the UAE. Um, to make it even more complicated, each little emirate has its own corporate registry. Um, so it's really difficult to search half of them, even in a public way. Um, another big problem was the UK did delay by a few weeks um, imposing sanctions on oligarchs. Uh, so it was a few weeks after the US in the EU that it really started acting against businessmen. Um, we think it's because the sanctions regime was quite new to the UK. We had just left Europe. We had depended on the European regime previously, and we didn't have our own infrastructure. But it did allow people like Abramovich to reshuffle stuff, so that was a problem. Um, and then finally, lack of training and resources within government um, to uh, you know, participate in, in forces to track these assets down and freeze them. Um, so a lot of challenges, but that's great because it means we've got a lot to write about. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful insight so far. Um, just to add one thing, and then I would like to um, offer you to um, ask something um, to, if you have any questions, and we hopefully try to uh, try to answer them. But uh, one observation we had in Germany as well was uh, that I had an, uh, uh, there was an, I was in conversation with uh, some some people from the police stations which were responsible for a yard which was in Hamburg, in the, in the port of Hamburg. And the interesting thing was that there were two different police administrations who were responsible for this, uh, for the port, and they tried to shift the yard from one administration to the other. Because they said, you know, like, um, it's just too much work, we don't know what to do with this thing, yeah? We don't know how to even to apply the German rules, the basic German rules, uh, to seize the asset, and uh, uh, what to do once you seized it, or once you freezed it, um, and uh, so the yard, there was, uh, there was um, no responsibility from the German side to take this yard. So it was a, a huge debate about it and it was uh, showing the kind of bizarre situations uh, where, where, we, where we stood and exactly what you say. So for journalists, it's a, of course a very, very uh, important and, and, and very good topic. So yeah, any questions, um, any, anything you want to know from my colleagues? Um, yeah, I start to with uh, you, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, what about uh, the, the political consequences in the UK? Have you, for example, seen 
from this kind of investigation the starting of the party? Okay. I was saying, what about the political consequences and the, the, the uh, has, for example, this kind of investigation started a debate on, on the role of, of trusts in the UK and on the need to, to change rules? Thank you. Hmm. I mean, the UK, um, as you all know, is at the center of a, a web of tax havens, um, former uh, British colonies, um, so crown dependencies and overseas territories like the British Virgin Islands. Cayman Islands, uh, Jersey, Isle of Man. There is a whole industry in the UK that's grown up around servicing the secret um, ownership of assets and movement of money. Um, so, no, I would say I, I would say that the debate is still I, that the political, the current government is ambivalent about dismantling that. I would, um, for example, uh, it was very slow to introduce uh, measures to the land registry which would, um, for, before you could only, you could just get away with um, putting a property in the name of a BVI company. Um, and it, the government has now introduced changes that allow you to see who is the real person behind that, behind that BVI company. So, but it was slow, and it took a lot of noise and protest to make it happen. Um, uh, I think we were meant to have, by this year, um, uh, registers of beneficial owners open to the public in all the tax havens that are affiliated to the UK, but I don't think that legislation is tabled to get to, you know. It, well, it was voted on by the British Parliament, but there's n and so now it would have to be implemented by um, the various territories, and there seems to be no progress towards that. I don't think it's going to happen this year. Um, so not enough. Um, what we have seen is is a, I would perhaps say slightly cynical use of the sanctions to, to make it look like you're doing something, you know, and it, it, they're real. I mean, you know, these, these people's assets are, are uh, blocked. They can't acquire new ones, that's for sure, not in their own names. Um, but, um, and, and so often when we, when we report on somebody, somebody, so we've been reporting on uh, an offshore services firm in Cyprus called Merit Service, and uh, last week, the UK government sanctioned Merit Service and its founder. So they'll, they'll be quite quick to pick up on, a, on our reporting and use it to slap a sanction on someone. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, so that is happening, but there's not enough debate around trusts and secrecy and tax havens. There's another yes, question. Uh, I have a question. One thing is declaring sanctions, but simultaneously there is busting of sanctions, and it happens in the same countries that declare sanctions very often. Do you track that as well, or we only have the side of intentions? Thank you. Is that you? Yeah, no, uh, we didn't. Um, so I, I, maybe, maybe I didn't get the question, so can you repeat it? Uh, well, one thing is that a country declares sanctions, right. but there is avoiding sanctions. And sometimes the companies that help the avoidance are in those countries that have declared sanctions. Right. And right. Uh, I'm just asking right. if your project is about the intentions or the results. Thank you. Exactly. So, um, so the intentions are quite clear. The results is exactly what we want to want to encourage um, that uh, not only we, but also other journalists are actually working um, as much as possible with all these, uh, with the information, with the tools actually to, to work on these kind of which results are actually achieved because we now have, a, I, think, I think in these weeks or in the last days, you could actually read a lot that there's a, a certain, um, we, we, we draw some conclusions right now and we see that the, the, the whole sanctions system is not working as, we, as many wished. Um, and, and that the loopholes are not only used by the oligarchs them themselves, that, but as you say, you know, like are um, helped by many uh, companies also like in the West. So there's a lot of stuff which is, um, uh, which is unregulated and un, uh, kind of, which is, there's a lot of unwanted consequences as well. And I think one reason is that um, the countries, but also the public never took the sanctions re regime very serious. Yeah, they just imposed it um, as a symbolic act, more or less. I mean, you, you talked about Iran and other countries. Nobody took notice of it, um, and uh, in this case, uh, this case actually prove that we don't have the tools we actually needed um, if we were serious. Just, I, I want to also like open up one more angle to this, which is like obviously. 
Sanctioning oligarchs is sort of a game from 2016, right? It's like a very fun thing to do when there's like a, a frozen conflict somewhere and you're trying to kind of slowly shift the balance of power in Russia towards maybe at some point overthrowing Putin, right? At this point, right, I feel we're in a situation also where we can barely guarantee that like chips from factories in, in, in southern Germany aren't being used in cruise missiles that end up in um, hit, uh, killing people in, in, in southern Ukraine, right? And so um, there's also like a question of like, what is this focused on, right? Is it focused on, on, on still this game of like trying to play out the different power elites in Russia against each other, which hopefully is going to become important at some point again? Um, or is it also just like bare, bare minimum trying not to be involved in weapons deliveries to the Russian armed forces, right? Um, which would be nice if we didn't. Yeah, thanks a lot for your interventions. Uh, in your view, would you say the sanctions have been effective uh, and achieved their goal? Yeah, I, I, what is the goal? Um, yeah, I mean, there are many, there are many goals. Aren't there? So there's discouraging support for Putin. There's ultimately starving the regime of money. Uh, we're talking, you know, there are sanctions that would affect the Russian economy. I keep going back to the oligarchs, I suppose, because that's the more interesting, but the kind of probably more effective, less interesting side is, you know, oil embargoes, um, well, not less interesting necessarily, but there aren't the big personalities involved. Oil embargoes, uh, no, not particularly effective. I mean, that, you know, that um, the, the price caps on oil, etc. cetera, the, the oil is, we think, being rooted through China and India, uh, so there are still revenues coming in. Um, uh, gas export, yes, uh, much harder now for Russia than it was. So, but that was that was a decision taken by Russia to <laughs> cut off the gas. Um, and um, uh, you know, weaponry, chips, etc. Do see? I mean, we've got our foreign editor, foreign editor here in the room, actually, uh, Jamie Wilson, who's probably much better on this than me. But you know, the, the Russian economy is due to uh, grow more than the British economy this year, in 2023, according to the IMF. Um, so, uh, you know, we've sanctioned ourselves out of Europe and the UK, uh, and that seems to have had a much more <laughs> powerful economic effect than perhaps the sanctions have on Russia. Um, You're gonna invade Ireland. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, in terms of kind of um, limiting the sphere and influence of the Russian state, yes, I think, you know, in a soft power way, these, these certainly have have an impact. Um, and, and because this is not an armed, <coughs> because Europe and America are not part of the armed conflict, this has been, this is the response, right? This is the response, essentially, other than sending weaponry in and providing other kind of material support to Ukraine. And it has been quite unifying. Um, and it has been good to see the UK, you know, having, distance itself from Europe, get behind Europe and America on this financial um, retaliation. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, um, it's been good for journalists. Uh, you know, I can now write about people, not freely, but um, you, know, you still have to be really careful. But I, we can now tell the truth uh, about Russian influence into Europe um, and, and, and the damage that that may have done. Yeah, there's one thing to add maybe. Um about the effectiveness that some economists, just one sentence, some economists say, you know, of course, it hasn't been as effective as hoped for, but, uh, but they also say that we weren't really, um, uh, so we, we, we weren't really going uh, uh, all the road down. So, so we, we imposed the sanctions, and there would have been ways actually to, be, to be much stricter, but in a way, we kind of stepped back. For example, uh, uh, Germany um, didn't, so, so you all know that the SWIFT, the SWIFT um, uh, system was uh, banned uh, for Russia, except actually gas exports to Germany. So Germany used uh, the SWIFT um, system still for, using, uh, for, for buying gas until last year. So they say, you know, being much more um, stringent um, would have had more effects on, um, on, on the Russian system. So it's a kind of, I, I would say it's a kind of a mixed results. So it's much less effective than we hope for. I think there, there are some effects, like the unification of all the Western interests. And it is a sign, actually, 
and uh, maybe there's a, a lot of lot to learn for, I would say, future uh, sanction uh, regimes. Um, so we have one minute to go, otherwise we are kicked out. So I would like to take this question, yeah. There are sanctions also on trade, for example, from the fourth package uh, of sanction of the EU on uh, uh, 15 of March of last year, uh, that was on, um, on the luxury uh, goods. Uh, I was wondering if, because I'm, I'm writing for uh, Domani, uh, Italian newspaper uh, about economics, and um, I would like to know if you cover parallel markets and uh, I'm asking to Friedrich if uh, did you uh, develop or is it possible to develop a software to track parallel imports? Because I'm also writing on, on that and the database, the problem is also the data are not updated or they're about to be updated with the uh, last year. And for example, the um, Eurostat uh, data sets. I mean, Eurostat is one thing, right? There's also, um, you can get, if you look around on the internet, um, the import-export databases of Russia, right? So you can like see what vendors have historically been sending in and out goods. And um, that could also be a way of addressing this to kind of look at, okay, here's like 50 Italian concerns that have been importing goods to, to Russia. Um, let's see if we can find evidence that they've either stopped or are still doing it, right? Um, that m it might be much more itemized than, than looking at the big Eurostat or Comtrade kind of uh, aggregated um, uh, transits, right? I'm checking like five other countries where are passing, might pass the, the goods. Yeah, so, so I think like Turkey, so we have to, D uh, Dubai. We have to move this to a parallel discussion, unfortunately. Thank you so much. I, thank you so much for your attendance and uh, hopefully to see you in this, uh, the next days. <laughs>